off Exeter. Welcome to Next Stop Exeter. In this episode, we commemorate Memorial Day. Memorial Day was started in the 1860s during the Civil War. It became an official national holiday in 1868 when it was first known as Decoration Day. Today, we celebrate Memorial Day on the last Monday of the month of May. And joining us here in studio is Exeter resident George Dufour. George was born and raised in Exeter, served the United States Army, and undertook a project to commemorate individuals who served in World War II. George, welcome to the studio. Glad to be here and thank you. Thanks for uh, coming and spending some time with us to talk about okay. a very uh, important topic. Right. So you served the United States Army. Yes. I went in uh, in 1953 in October, a lot of stages of Korean War, basically the shooting was pretty close to being over then. Uh, went to Georgia after basic training for six months of radio school and ended up in um, Stuttgart, Germany. And uh, I spent the rest of uh, my enlistment in uh, the Stuttgart area, yeah. And then you came back to Exeter and been here ever since? Pretty much, yeah. We did move out for a little bit while I was uh, working as a federal firefighter in, uh, at uh, New Boston, New Hampshire Satellite Tracking Station. Um, and uh, I retired in 1986 as uh, uh, fire chief. And then we had a home in Florida and came back here also. And been here ever since. So Memorial Day is uh, meant as an observance for those who gave their lives uh, in service to the country. Correct. You undertook a project 15 years ago where you sought out individuals who served in World War II. Right. Uh, I assume some of those individuals are still with us today, but I would very much like to hear your story about the whole process, what inspired you to meet these individuals uh, to, to uh, investigate their experiences and then have the ability to share those experiences um, with the Exeter community. Okay. I think uh, only two, uh, maybe three of those veterans are still alive out of the 15, 16, whatever they were. Um, <laughs> I always liked history. I, uh, I, I did well in history in school, not Latin. But... I should have done this program, not this, pro my program, interviewing 10 years before I started this. I had the camera, I had the, the people in Exeter who were World War II veterans uh, were more numerous. There were prisoners of war who were still here in Exeter, still, still with us. I should have done it then and I, kick myself mentally over the years for not starting earlier. And I don't know why I didn't. Anyway, at some point the light went on and I said, gee, I'd, I'd like to interview some of these guys. I knew mo almost all of them who, you know, that I did come to uh, interview. And uh, I had the camera. The fellow next door, Don Richard, was at Pearl Harbor in the Navy when the Japanese bombed it in 1941. I said, well, I'm going over and speak to Don. After a few minutes, he, he consented to tell his story. He had basically really never told it before. In fact, I talked to his son last week said, I never heard that story, he said, until I saw his, his film. And that's a common, a common 
yes. occurrence with yes. people who served in the military. Yes, it certainly is. In fact, some of the family members of these people came over later to borrow the VHS at that time and make copies for themselves. They had never heard these stories. They really never did. So I spoke with Don, and uh, he, he consented. And I said, look, I'm an amateur at this, you know, I, but I do like history. I, I know enough about World War II. Uh, I was seven, 1941, so I remember a lot what happened. So uh, Don was in the Navy. Of course, at that time, he joined, I think, in around 1939, 1940. There were almost no jobs around. In fact, there were two, three, four veterans who did the same thing. They had no jobs, so they went in National Guard or in a regular military before the war. So Don happened to be in the Navy, and he was stationed on a, uh, a seaplane tender the Curtis in Pearl Harbor. And uh, according to him, uh, that morning, Sunday, he said, we a bunch of us sitting out and having coffee on the deck, just kind of talking, shooting the bull there, and uh, half the crew was ashore. And he said, when we saw the planes, big deal, right? But he said, they were strange. They were strange looking. He said, the next thing, I saw buildings being blown up, and then the ships, well. <laughs> so they got general quarters sounded for what crew were on that particular ship, and the uh, guns, of course, were covered with what he called bloomers, in other words, canvas coverings over the uh, 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 gun barrels, had to cut those off. Ammo was locked up in the ammo lockers on the ship. The fellow who was in charge had the key and he was on shore. So open up the ammo lockers with fire axes. So they finally started shooting and uh, one bomb hit his ship, and a plane was shot down. I don't know, and I don't think Don knew who actually shot that plane down. But it landed on, on his ship and did quite a bit of damage. At some point, because uh, he saw other ships being blown up, and it was, you know, it was just pandemonium. It was chaos. He said... First uh, type of combat all of us had seen. Nobody knew what to do. Just do common sense things, right? Well, that ship eventually made it back to Frisco to be repaired. Not in Pearl Harbor because the uh, ships like cruisers and battleships had to be repaired first, the actual warships. So later on, Don was transferred to a destroyer, and uh, <laughs> Guadalcanal was on, and they had to bring 55-gallon drums of gasoline for the planes, throw them off the, the uh, stern of the ship that he was on, so they would float in towards Guadalcanal so that the planes, what few planes they had even at that time, had some fuel. So he did quite a bit in that area. And uh, he uh, also later on was on a destroyer escort that was on picket duty outside uh, the main uh, landing areas of Okinawa. And those picket boats that were out there, destroyers, destroyer escorts, were to intercept kamikaze planes when they were first being in use, and they mm -hmm. really raised cane in Okinawa. In fact, uh, one, one fellow here from uh, Exeter was killed by a, kam a kamikaze. Uh, one of two that, brothers. Do you know who that was? Oh, yeah, that yeah name Joe is? Chatney. And his brother, Tommy, later on was killed in Korea. So that, that Chatney family, who we were very friendly with, uh, lost 
two boys. Yeah. And were they extra high school yes. graduates? Yeah. Um, I can't swear about Joe. He had to have gone here to, to school because the family was here for many, many years. Tommy was. Tommy was uh, one, or one year or two years ahead of me in school. So that was, it was interesting to talk to Don, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that I finally thought of the uh, story. So you had about 15 people yeah. that you interviewed. Yeah. The incident which took place in Pearl Harbor was that obviously very dramatic in terms of people from Exeter yeah. being exposed to World War II. Right. But from what I understand, there were other individuals who were also involved in um, uh, events that took place that were equally as horrifying as Pearl Harbor. Uh, there were. There were... One fella, Al Cop, who was really a nice fella, nice guy, he saw a lot of action. He was in the 10th Mountain Division. They saw quite a bit of action. They did their training, by the way, in uh, Colorado. But they ended up in Italy, in the mountains there, which he said the training in Colorado really helped him out in the mountains. and. Uh, Al saw a lot of action there. Uh, the, uh, the Germans had really uh, defended their different lines. They called them different lines. One was a Gustav line, I remember, and it and, uh, was tough going for, for the uh, U.S. there. Al was wounded. And when he was lying on his stretcher, his captain came over and said goodbye, it was great serving with you, et cetera, et cetera. And Al said, I have no water. He said, could you give me a drink from your canteen? And he says, you take my canteen. He says, I'll take yours and I'll fill up at, at the spring. He said, we were filling up at a spring, but we had to be very careful. And he said, before I was jeeped out of there, he said the captain had gone over and a machine gun opened up, killed the captain. At this point, Al, Al Kopp was in tears. In fact, there was, I think, three, three of the guys were crying on, on, uh, on the tapes. Uh, Al said, I never, never forgot it. Al had a great memory. Remember the fellows who were with him in that, in that squad who got wounded? A uh, very, very good man uh, to listen to. So 15 years ago, war ends in 1945. Yeah. So on average, these have been all people who had been born around 1925. Yeah. These people today would all be around 90 years old. So yes. at the time, they were, say, 75 years old. Yeah. So for the most part, they seem to have a fairly good memory as it relates to the events which had yes. taken place. Yes. You know, so much earlier, you know, 55 years earlier. Right. Uh, the, the, the fellow who had the, the best memory, boy, I envied him for memory, was Lou Gallero, who we always called for years Gario. But he made it plain, I would like to go back to the old Italian way, it's Gallero. His family owned a store on Court Street where the fire station is now. That store was there for years. And uh, uh, Lou was in the Army. He remembered the ship he went over on, uh, across the Atlantic on. He fought in North Africa. He visited relatives in North Africa, Italian relatives. They had come from Sicily and they were in North Africa. At some point, he got... Uh, transferred to Italy, and he was stationed at Anzio, landed at Anzio, and, and Anzio, if you, man, oh man, I mean, that was a brutal, brutal exercise in battle. Uh, the, the military at that time had a very small foothold on shore, and the Germans just kept plastering them with uh, artillery and, of course, tanks, etc. If it wasn't for uh, battleships and cruisers offshore, those men would have all been annihilated. It was, those, it was the uh, Navy ships that kept, kept the uh, Germans at bay. Uh, I saw quite a bit of action. 
So of these 15 people, they all came back safely. Yep. Some of them were wounded. Were any of them captured? Yes. Uh, it's too bad, as I said, it's too bad I hadn't thought of this some years before because there were actual Exeter men who had been prisoner of war. I couldn't find any Exeter man at this time, but there was a fellow from Kingston. I said, well, that's close enough. He was on the Bataan Death March, which uh, was a horror show. Uh, he joined up the, in the military and the Air Force before the war started because he was another fellow who could not find a job around during the Depression. So he was stationed at the, in the Philippines. And he was at what he called was Nichols Field, was a field for fighter planes. Clark Field was the big base. That was for uh, bombers. And that was, he said, further north. So he was at, at this fighter base. And in November, for some reason, he said, we were moved out of our wooden barracks to tents out in the, out in the woods, out in the boondocks. He said, something's up. Why would they do that for security? Well, yeah, we know what was up. December 7th was coming, but all the politicians said, we know nothing about it. Well, somebody knew something about it. He was not the first one, by the way, to say that something, we did have, we, we had to do something different just before Pearl Harbor. Why was that? Well, something happened. So <laughs> the Japanese really uh, had not much of a battle to take over where he was. He made it out to uh, Bataan, and that's where the war for him ended. He said, I never even got to fire a shot. He said, we had to give up. He said, we broke up our rifles, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, weaponry that the Japanese would not be able to use. And he started in on the death march. Hot, hot, hot. It was in there, call it summer. Four days plus part of a fifth day, no water, no food. Uh, hundreds of, of uh, military, both Filipino and American military, killed on the march. He said uh, one time uh, a truck came down and they had it, the guys in the truck, the Japanese guys, had a board sticking out between the uh, uh, sideboards and the board was sticking out and they were cutting over so that the board would smash the uh, walking prisoners in the head and neck and face. And, uh, anybody got out of line, bayoneted, shot, did, didn't matter. They lost, I can't tell you how many. At some point later on, when they reached the camp, uh, he was put on a ship and brought to a city in Japan where he worked near the docks in a huge coal yard. Uh, we had, he said we had to shovel off coal from the barges into trucks and that's where the war ended for Arthur Reynolds. Really nice guy. Tall, lanky fellow like himself and he said when the Japanese would beat him, they would have him sit like on a stump so they could reach him. And then they would beat him with the rifle butts, lost, lost uh, everything on his left, left side, I think it was. Everything was broken, eye socket, plus the teeth were gone. Uh, he said it was, you know, for no reason. I mean, somebody would come by evidently and have the 
urge to beat up on some prisoner. Um, have you by chance, you, you've mentioned three individuals yeah. already. Did you have an opportunity to interview any women? That yes, I'm just going to look at one right now. Oh, great. This lady here technically was not in the military, but she was a nurse and her husband was in the military. He was a doctor. He was stationed actually in Long Island. I just taught, I just saw her uh, video a couple of days ago again, and uh, she was very good, and uh, she saw a lot in Washington, D.C. A lot of the veterans came back, and they were, there were so many wounded veterans, they would pass a lot at different hospitals around Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and in New York. And so she had worked at, at both those areas. And she saw her husband at times because he was stationed out at a base out on the end of Long Island. And he worked with a lot of the dependents' wives. He, he was like um, Ob, Obgen, I think you would call it. And he did a lot with them. With the, with the women who were having children. And the wife, the nurse, uh, Marguerite Bourgeois, she did an awful lot with veterans and with veterans' wives also in the hospital where she was. Uh, she told a lot of stories of how uh, what it was like to be in, in the war in New York City compared to later on after the mm -hmm. war. And uh, she had an awful lot of uh, college uh, credits. Uh, her husband later on after the war opened up a practice in Boston and she followed him there also to be a nurse. But then they ended up here in Exeter, or she did. She ended up in Exeter after his passing. And uh, she has a son here in Exeter. And uh, she was uh, a delight to speak with. And I had another lady. Uh, she was a major in the wax. She ended up as a major. She did not go overseas during the war, but she did after the war. And her name is? Avis Watkins, and I interviewed her at the uh, Eventide home on High Street, which is not there anymore. And uh, Avis was a sergeant in the wax for quite a while. And uh, she was in the motor transportation sector. And after the war, uh, she said that you know, a lot of the uh, uh, GIs were coming back and wanted what jobs there were left in the military because the military was being cut right down to nothing. So she was discharged, but she was able after one year to come back into the military. And she went to more schooling for the military, and she ended up in, uh, at, at the Pentagon for a few years there. And she went to OCS, the Officers Candidate School, and, and became a, an officer. And later she was sent to Bremerhaven, Germany. Uh, she was there for several years. And in fact, I landed at Bremerhaven as a coincidence when I was uh, uh, in the army, and took a train b after Bremerhaven back to Germany. So she, we ended up actually at the same place. So, so if, if it, our viewers that have an interest in seeing this interview with her yeah. and the other 14 uh, veterans that served, I understand they can actually go to the Exeter Public Library yeah. and see this video? What I did was, I, the first thing I did was take the VHS tapes and have them converted over to uh, DVDs. And I gave a set to the Historical Society. I said, well, let's hope they're in, in business for another 50 or 100 years, and, but these will be over there anyway. And then at some point, 
But uh, a while later, I said, I'm going to make up a set for the uh, library, which I did. And then I understand that Frank Ferraro also made up a set, an extra set. So the library has two sets. One is a backup. I, I, hope, I hope they don't disappear. Uh, there's a lot of local history. Uh, and the stories that I got uh, really were quite interesting. I had two brothers. I don't know how much time you have here, but there are two brothers, the Bergeron brothers here in Exeter. Uh, one flew B-47s, but he flew warplanes during the war, and then after that he was stationed at Pease, and he flew B-47s. And during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, they loaded the atom bomb onto him at Pease. His, his station was a taxiway at Logan Airport. and just waiting for the word to go to Russia. And he knew it was going to be a one-way trip, that it wasn't coming back. And he was there for several days. Uh, he had a lot, he, he retired as, as a colonel, I believe, and he had 28,000 hours of flying time for the Air Force, which is a lot of hours. Mm. And his brother, Fran Bergeron, was in, he is another fellow went in the military before the war, was stationed with a jungle fighting group, and he was down to Panama going through training in the actual jungle in Panama when the war broke out. And they sent him to the Pacific, and he saw a lot of action on the islands in the Pacific until he got malaria for the second time, quite, quite bad and then they got him out of there. But he was on the island of New Britain, and he, like he said, it was almost all swamp, you know. And at some point I asked him, I said, Franny, you're saying there was a lot of swamp. Oh yeah, he said, we were in water all the time. I said, when you killed Japanese, how did you bury him? Oh, he said, we didn't bury him. He said, we put him on anthills. And after a couple of days, nothing left but, you know, was a skeleton. And he says, I'm sure they did the same to us. So little tidbits like that, you don't hear about that often, you know? Sure. Yeah, and you certainly don't hear about them at Memorial Day celebrations. <laughs> That's right. That's for sure. That's right. So uh, do you typically attend Memorial Day parades here yeah. in town? Yeah, yeah. They've gotten a lot smaller since I was a kid. But there's a lot less World War II vets to partake of them. Years ago, there were several bands, including the Academy Band. Of course, the high school band always has been there. Uh, but there was a, a, a band, the Legion had a band, and a pretty good sized parade years ago, really. Okay. Uh, but it has, it has dwindled down. Well, I'd like to encourage viewers of our show to participate in this year's uh, Memorial Day Parade, which will be coming up on the last Monday of the month of May. Um, George, I certainly appreciate your willingness to come in the studio and no share problem. some of your stories. People would like to learn more. All you need to do is go to the Exeter Public Library, and they have George's interviews on a DVD. How long is the, is the DVD? Is it a two-hour? Uh... There are some DVDs that have one uh, veteran on there. Probably an hour, hour and 10, 15 minutes. For each veteran that you interview? Yep. Some veterans are a little shorter. Uh, and being a strict amateur, there are a couple of uh, uh, DVDs that <laughs> the veteran sat like in front of a window, which made it come out darker than normal. Uh, in the final uh, uh, take, which I didn't realize. I did not realize that at the time. But the voices are good, and uh, it's, the stories are quite important because you'll never hear them again. These, they're all gone now. You know? mm. At least we saved this many stories. Well, thank you yeah. for doing it. It's, it's quite an right. accomplishment, and uh, certainly appreciate the fact that somebody in town here was willing to collect those stories right. and uh, just as importantly share them. Thanks for having me.
Pleasure is all it. ours. Thank you. That's all for this week's uh, segment of Next Stop Exeter. Please feel free to visit us on our uh, Facebook page, Next Stop Exeter, where you can now also see uh, previous episodes of our show uh, on YouTube. Once again, thanks for joining us here to commemorate uh, Memorial Day. Thank you.